Alhamdulillah, Hirabil Alameen, was Salah, was Salam, Allah, Nabiana, Mohammed, while Ali was Sahbihi, was Salam, and Mabad, Habatifillah, a beautiful question which was very well articulated from one of our brothers was asked, uh, and it's actually in, maybe in the form of advice uh, related to distinguishing between political policies and what's going on, for example, in the Middle East, and our scholars, who a lot of us adhere to, which reside in the Middle East, which are ulama of these countries. How do we distinguish between the two? And if we see strange policies or policies we don't agree with or policies which could be wrong, does that reflect on the ulama? Does it take from the integrity of the ulama? So those are actually very important questions which do have to be addressed. And I'm going to give a humble attempt from my background with regards to uh, these questions. And I know it won't be give the topic justice because in fact this requires time and energy and effort but and, and research. But I think in the most simplest of terms, I could say that first, I answer this or advise in three things. The first thing is that it's absolutely imperative that we separate between politicians, political policies, from the Tao of Ahlasunna. And really that has been the case throughout history that the scholars in the past were much more removed from being under or appointed by a government. And so this is just the case of Islamic history. But with regards to that, we have full uh, trust in our ulama because of the example they've showed us and because of the knowledge that they have uh, put out which is in agreement with the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the understanding of the salaf of this ummah. So this is why we have trust in our scholars. First one point we have to mention, ulama do not make policy. So if you see a president doing this, or a king doing this, or such and such happening in such and such country, this is not a reflection of the scholars. The scholars do not make political policy. And especially Salafi scholars. I don't know of any countries where Salafi scholars, even here in Saudi Arabia, they are not the policy makers. They may have comments about policies openly and some things that are asked to them, that they will reject, but they cannot really, they may have some influence on policy because the, the country uh, respects, the government respects the scholars, still to a high degree. Uh, however, they do not make policy. Number two, uh, ulama, they encourage the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. So that means the scholars and likewise, the du'at are not responsible for defending anyone's mistakes and anyone's sin and anyone's oppression. That's not the job of the scholars. And that's not the job of the du'at. That, for example, you may disagree with some policy or see oppression in a policy of a particular government. But your job is not to defend that policy. Nor is it the job of the ulama. But rather, their job is to encourage people to adhere to the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, which is a sami wa ta ala maryam muslim fi ma yuhibbu wa kariya ma lam yu'miru bi ma'siyatin fi idha umira bi ma'siyatin fala sam'a wa la ta'a so the scholars are called to adhere to the policy of hearing and obeying the muslim ruler in those things which we love and those things which we dislike as long as they do not call us to sin and if they call us to sin there is no hearing and obeying the scholars mention from the past not this is some political uh, uh, political maneuver by our scholars but the scholars of the past let us know that this hadith is not does not negate ta'a and in its in absolute meaning 
that you that not listening and obeying means not listening and obeying in the policy of sinfulness but still you must hear and obey the ruler because they're Muslim even if they become press, oppressive and this you'll find in all the books go to Aqidah to Tahuiya go to Imam Baba Hari's Shara Sunnah go to go to go to go to more importantly go to Bukhari and Muslim and you'll find that this is the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah this is what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Salaf of this Ummah uh, advised us with and ordered us with and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says uh, hear, hear, I mean, obey Allah and obey His message and those charged in authority over you. Let's give a concrete example. If the scholars, if the po policy of the country was to order you to take riba, I don't know of any Muslim countries that order the people. They may allow riba. Riba is, is just entrenched in the world. But they do not make it Legitimate. They do not say riba is okay. They allow that policy. However, you can choose to be away from that. That does not mean they authenticate and legitimize the sin just because sinfulness takes place in their country. So that's very important that we have to distinguish between that because as Sheikh al-Islam uh, uh, ibn al-Qayyim and I believe Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah says that al-istihlal, making something legitimate, is in the heart. Qalbiya. It's not just doing. For example, if you fall, fall into zina, that doesn't mean you believe zina is halal. You may feel sorrow, but because of your weakness, you've committed that action. So the istihlal is when you believe. That is an uh, issue imaniya. It's related to your itiqad. Issue itiqadiya. It's related to your aqidah. So very important that we understand that. That the ulama, they call to the sunnah, which is not to cause fitna, and it's not to rebel, and that they are not policy makers. The second point I want to mention, the scholars do not lose, but the people lose when they leave the scholars. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders, فَاسْأَلَّ أَهْلِ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ If you don't know, ask the people of knowledge. And we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that, what he started the ayat, فَاسْأَلَّ أَهْلِ ذِكْرٍ That's a command. That's a command. And al amr yufid al wujub. Whenever there's a command in the Sharia, we said it countless times. What? Then that means that it's an obligation to follow, unless there's other Sharia evidence to show otherwise. So here, Allah is commanding us, ordering us that when we don't know, that means we don't know. We know to establish the five daily prayers. I don't. We don't need to make a call to Sheikh Salih bin Fozan to know about his five daily prayers wajib upon us in the UK or wajib upon us in America. We don't need to know that. We know that. But if you don't know, you must ask the ulama. Okay? Those issues which you don't know, where there's doubtfulness, where you just don't know, ask the ulama. So you need the ulama, the ulama don't need you. That's very important for us to realize that. In their place, as the Prophet mentioned, that there would arise people that part of the prophetic prophecy that you'll find mentioned in Bukhari and Muslim. That the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there would be people who would misguide. I believe this is in the hadith of Hudayfa bin Yaman. And other than that hadith, that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there would be du'at ala abwaab jahannam. There would be uh, uh, people who call at the gates of the hellfire. Why? Because they're people who are ignorant and they're people who call to bid'ah. The Prophet ﷺ drew a line in the sand. He said, have a sabil Allah. And then he drew on the right and the left. He said, Hadahi Subur. And then he mentioned uh, uh, on every head of those paths, he said that, you know, this is the path of Allah. And then on the right and on the left, he drew lines. And he said, those are different paths. And at the end of each of those paths, there is people calling to Jahannam, letting us know that those are the other paths of the hellfire. Those could be paths of, uh, of permanent hellfire, meaning path of kufr, likewise path of bid'ah, meaning of ahla bid'ah. Ahla bid'ah is not calling you to good, because if they're calling you, the bid'ah that they call you to are calling you to jama'at and hizbiyah and to groups and sects which call to the fire. Because the Prophet ﷺ let us know that kulu bid'ah and dalala, every bid'ah is, is misguidance. 
And every dalala misguidance leads to the fire. The Prophet said, If tarkatil Yahuda firka ila akhra hadith. He said the Jews break into seventy one sects, Christian seventy two sects, my ummah seventy three sects, all of them in the fire except one. Letting us know that some of the ummah of Muhammad وسلم, would be in the fire. And some of them would be callers to the fire. Because the Prophet said, said Duat ala Abu Abba Jahannam. Dua, dua to people who call to the gates of the hellfire. So if we don't ask the people of Sunnah, then of course we're going to end up asking the people of Bid'ah. We're going to ask the people who say, yeah, you can buy one house on Riba. Oh yeah, you know, that's a necessity. Oh, don't go to the Islamic banking finance if, if perhaps there is a legitimate one. But go to the uh, regular bank because it's going to give you a much better rate, a much better return on your money. It's going to give you this, it's going to give you this. So they will make fatawa that agrees with your desires but calls you to the hellfire, calls you to away from that which is clear from the book of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa So remember, the da'wah and its people will go on, even if they're few. How do we know this? The Prophet ﷺ said, There won't cease to be a group from my nation who, is a, who, uh, who continues to be on the truth. And the, those people who differ with them uh, uh, or cause them harm or try to cause them harm, uh, they won't be able to cause them harm until the hour is established. That doesn't mean some won't get killed. That doesn't mean, won't, won't, doesn't mean some won't get in prison. That won't mean that doesn't mean that some won't be ostracized. But what it means is they really they will not truly be harmed because they'll be protected with Allah if they call to the haq, if they were calling to the haq with hikmah and wisdom and 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 righteousness and gentleness and goodness then they will be protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَمَّا فِي دُنْيَا أَوْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ Either in this life or the hereafter. So Ahl al-Sunnah mawjood, they'll still be there. Also, a last, another point is also realize that no one is infallible. So if you hear from an alam or someone less than him, because sometimes you hear, you hear, I think, a misconception we've seen in the West that has been propagated. I've seen it with my own eyes. We have experience, okay? And I've seen it with my own eyes, unfortunately, that some of the brothers, in the past especially, is they thought they had to defend the governments. So then they defended everything. Instead of just saying, Khas, that, that Amir, that leader, that president made a mistake. That's, that's incorrect what he's doing. Or just keep it silent. But instead, they go into it and they defended mistakes. And that is a cause for discrediting the Tao. Our job is not to defend any country we don't raise I'm from America I don't I don't have another uh, 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 nationality I'm not responsible for defending but I defend Tawheed and I defend the Bilad Tawheed in that which they do is, is good they make uh, here in Saudi Arabia they uh, encourage the scholars and encourage scholarship in, in Islam Islamic scholarship they encourage uh, and 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 Preserve Tawheed, it's in their schools, okay? Uh, they have a lot of uh, benefits. They, they uh, implement the Sharia, okay? They do a lot of khair, and they've done a lot of khair. They are responsible for spreading, helping the spread of da'wah for so many people to know Tawheed, even the people who dislike them. They have learned Tawheed, a lot of them, from the, from the books that they help to publish, publish. So it's very important to give credit where credit is due, but realize our job is not to defend anyone. If I hear sh my sheikh or any one of my mashayikh that we love making a mistake, I can't defend them. I can't say sheikh so-and-so did this. I defend them in that. No. If you have the ability and the tools, then you can look into the issue. If not, and, and it's a clear mistake, or another ulama, another alam is shown that it's a clear mistake, then you, you just say, I don't, you know, we're not on that. We don't follow anyone in mistakes. That's not what... Islam teaches us. And we already know we all make mistakes. Prophet ﷺ said, uh, All the children of Adam make mistakes and sin. But the best of those who sin are those who repent. Likewise, as the, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib said, We don't know the truth by men. 
but rather we know the men by the truth. So that means we measure individuals by their adherence to the truth, not because of their nationality, not because of their manzal, their status, not because of their race, not because of their hair, you know, whatever the different criterion, not because they get fatawa that agrees with our desires, but it's rather their adherence to the truth. What we see from them, that adherence to the truth. Uh, and another point, a last point I want to mention, because then the brother mentioned about who to take knowledge from. I advise, without going into, and I know this may not be as helpful, but I say take knowledge from anyone who adheres to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the madhab of the salaf of this ummah. And if they're not known for making many mistakes in accordance to the Quran, sunnah, and the understanding of the salaf, you know, in their tariqah of da'wah, their minhaj of da'wah, then take from them. Then take from them. If it is apparent to you that they call to the book and they're recommended by scholars or they, and they call you to the ulama. I know in the UK there are so many in all the cities, or many of the cities. I know, I, these are the names I know. Of course, Brixton, Birmingham, Cardiff, Luton, uh, 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 on and on down the line. So many, of course, uh, London, Croydon, all these places, all these places have du'at and talab uh, al-ilm that call to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And I know so many personally that I knew from Medina and so many personally that I knew from Yemen. So I know there's a lot of brothers calling to the book of Allah and the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the understanding of the salaf of this ummah. So strive to, uh, to, to gain and benefit from your local uh, du'at and, and mashayikh, if you will, uh, with regards to their levels. And a last way of uh, criterion for, deter for looking at them, this was uh, advice Sheikh Suleiman al-Rahili gave me the last time I was going to Yemen, when I was going to go to Dar al-Hadith Shehr in the Hadramaut. He said, as, and, and I'll never forget this, and I recorded it, that he said, he said, make sure that whatever you hear there, whatever you're learning, that you compare it to what you've learned uh, and, 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 and what these imams have said. Okay, and he mentioned four Rabbaniyun. These are imams of this era that, you know, there shouldn't be much doubt, especially with people who adhere to the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from Ahlul Sunnah, sh should have no doubt about these imams of this time who, who've all passed, Allah Yerhamahu. That, th and this is a criterion that you look for your du'at, do they refer, when they uh, refer to scholars, do they refer back to these great imams? And even when they refer to other scholars, are those scholars, what they're talking about and what they're practicing, and the benefits that they're bringing, is it in accordance with what these imams? That is a great criterion. It's a fantastic criterion. And Jazallah khayna to our Sheikh, Sheikh Suleiman al-Rahili al-Rabbani. He's also, even though he's young in age, but he gives his students tarbiyah. And ilm, he is a high-powered, you feel like blood is on the wall from the, from the benefit of the dars, like one lecture about a miswak. It's just, you get into Messiah, you can never imagine. It's like a book with someone else. So, aside from that praise, and may Allah bless him, he said, uh, he mentioned four imams, he mentioned to me, Bin Baz, Al-Albani, uh, Ibn Uthaymeen, and then what pleased me, because he knew I was going to Yemen, is when he said Imam Muqbil. He said, compare what you hear from, uh, whether they be the Mashaykh there, or students of knowledge, whatever you're, wherever you're, you're seeking the knowledge, to what you've heard from those ulama. And I took that to heart, and by Allah, I found some mistakes from certain students. We were attending certain books uh, with them just to make review and aqidah, and some issues came up. I said, I never heard this from the ulama. I, I never, what, what you're saying, I think is a mistake. I didn't want to call. He has more knowledge than me, but he also, his tarbiyah is just in that camp and just there, whereas I sat with many other ulama that he reads about and that he goes to the internet and listens to their lectures. But we were in, under their beards. So I knew what he was saying was a mistake. And then we took it to Sheikh Abdullah, and it was made clear that I was correct, not 
uh, you know, that it was in accordance with what our ulama have been saying. So my point is, is that gives you a criterion. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah Azza wa Jal. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself, Shaitan. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala Nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.